Happy Friday. It's great to see all of you. And it's Friday. You know what that means? It's our day to go through all your questions live. Everything that came in through Facebook, through Instagram, through our YouTube channel, basically from anything. We get to go through them one by one. We're going to rapid fire it. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not available. If you have any questions during the live, shoot them into the chat. I'd love to hear from you, especially if I'm answering one of your questions and you have a follow-up, let me know. Uh, let's not delay anymore. Let's get to it. Good morning. Get ready. Is it cold where you are? It's cold here in Phoenix. Even here in Phoenix, it's a little bit cold. So forgive me if I'm rubbing my hands together. Well, let's get going. Uh, first question comes from Beach Junkies. My back hurts since late June of this year. This is October, so that means we're four months into this. I couldn't even walk or stand up. I was bedridden because of it, and I can't get to the doctor to get looked at. I've always had back problems since I was younger, so I thought it was acting up again, but I've never had it this bad to make me bedridden. I bought a walker, and I guess it's still trying to heal on its own. I can't finally get to the bathroom, and now I can sit down and go to the shower. So, you know, I'm not getting a lot of clues as to what is the cause of this, of Beach Junkie, of your pain, but I will say um, this is too long. Basically, if you don't have any red flags, you're clear to treat at home for three weeks. If at the end of those three weeks, you're still having pain, that's really the time to see a doctor. We're now four months into this. We should have completed the entire treatment regimen by now, but instead, we're just now getting to the bathroom. It is true that 94% of people get better on their own within 12 weeks. And so I do see a lot, it's not, it's not a terrible strategy, especially if finances are the dominant concern. But I do see a lot of people just essentially trying to do this on their own and waiting it out. But people, if you have any opportunity to get the help you need in a timely fashion, it was three weeks and not four months. Let's keep going. Okay, I've got a question in the chat. Hold on, let me finish this one and, and I'll get right to you. I have to use a back brace just to get, just to help support my back if I'm trying to get around, hoping I can get to the car and get to the doctor's appointment. What do you think? Should I take medicine for the pain? And is it better to go for better? It's going on for four months now. Um, yeah, you know, non-steroidal, uh, the, the um, American Academy of Physicians, very prestigious group, put out guidelines in 2007 and again in 2017 for nonspecific low back pain, which is what we're talking about here. And their recommendations in after three weeks of home care were chiropractic, massage, um, acupuncture, physical modalities. They also recommend rest, which is very effective. They also recommend moist heat, like a jacuzzi or a hot towel in the microwave, that kind of thing. But then if medications are preferred, they did, they did recommend non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's Aleve, aspirin, um, ibuprofen. Some people, if you can't take NSAIDs, would, uh, would recommend Tylenol in, instead. So there are a lot of options. Um, also, your doctor can prescribe muscle relaxants. Personally, I've never, I, I, I'm not a fan, but that's in the, in the guidelines, it is proven, which means it is proven by the recommendations. All right, let's look at uh, the question we have from the chat from Andu Fuss. I have two lumbar discs bulging. My back isn't hurting much anymore, but the top of my left foot is a little numb and hurts. Will this numbness ever go away? Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Andrew. A bulging disc causes pain by causing irritation in the nerve root. The nerve root that goes to the top of the foot is the L5. It's also the one that bends your big toe backward and pulls your foot up when you're walking. So watch out if you have a little uh, steppage gait. That's when you step on that right, when your weight goes on that right heel, make sure you're not getting weakness where your foot is flopping down because that would be a motor deficit 
And that would be a mandatory MRI to figure out what's going on. The numbness will go away, but it takes a long time. Um, and it may not go away completely, but it usually does. Once the irritation in the nerve root subsides, the numbness starts to shrink. And I always see it as like a puddle after a storm. You start out with a big area of numbness, but then over time, if it doesn't rain again, it just starts getting smaller and smaller. The area of numbness gets smaller and smaller. And sometimes you're left with one little tiny spot that doesn't completely dry out where you do have some persistent numbness, but it should go away. One thing that's nice about dorsal foot numbness, numbness on the back of the foot, is it usually doesn't impede your function very much. So I'm glad to hear things are going well. Look forward to continued improvement. All right, let's move on to our next question. Um, and this one is from um, LDOCKC. Why do we have to keep putting a Band-Aid on damaged discs? My disc is bulging and compressing the spine. Why can't we fix this instead of awaiting for permanent damage? Great question. Um, and the answer is someday we will. Uh, but unfortunately, today is not that day. This is what's going on. So this is a, uh, a cross section of a disc. And here we've got the annulus, the outer part. Now this person doesn't have what L. Doc KC has. Dr. KC has a bulging disc. See how the annulus is broken here and the nucleus is sticking all the way out and irritating the nerve root? Well, this is a herniated disc, but the solution would be the same either way. It would be to come up with some way to improve this annulus so that it's no longer incompetent to make this heal across here. And the way that's gonna happen someday is we're gonna have stem cells which we can inject into there that are gonna identify the broken areas of the annulus. And we're gonna turbocharge those stem cells with the growth factors they need to knit it back together and heal it. Impossible? Probably not. That's what happens when you're young. The annulus heals poorly because it has a limited blood supply and healing is proportionate to blood supply in our bodies. But it definitely can heal. And so maybe we can have uh, targeted therapeutics over time. By the way, the spine isn't the only place this is a problem. Uh, in our friend, the knee, if you turn it around and take it apart, the, knee, the cartilaginous menisci in the knee, it's the exact same thing as the disc. It's made out of cartilage. Once it tears, our body, especially if you're over 50, has a really hard time healing it back together. Well, one solution in the knee is to inject a cartilaginous matrix, inject a, an engineered matrix, and then have stem cells land on that and heal it back together to essentially grow a new meniscus. It's the same thing with all arthritis. All arthritis works. You have a, a joint that's lined with this hyaline cartilage, this, this cartilage. It gets a nick in it. As it moves, the nick starts to damage the cartilage on the other side. Every additional movement, and that's true whether you're between the patella, this is the blue is the, the representation of the cartilage here. As that cartilage gets scratched, it just scratching begets more scratching, and the whole thing just goes on and on and on. Well, if we had growth factors and engineered therapeutics that could target and heal those, we wouldn't have this problem. Uh, someday we're gonna have that, but again, today is not that day. We're working on it though. We're definitely working on it. Uh, Prem Kumar, all right, I gotta admit, I'm really biased because when I first uh, started practicing as a doctor, one of my most beloved colleagues was a pulmonologist, an intensive care doctor whose name was Prem Kumar and I worked with him day and night trying to get people out of trouble and man, it's nice to have a wingman. And <laughs> when you're a neurosurgeon, your wingman is your pulmonologist. So anyway, Prem Kumar, I'm very highly biased. I love your name. Hello, doctor, hello, Prem Kumar. The issue I mentioned below, is it the same as a herniated disc? L4-5 central disc protrusion, mild posterior disc bulge, spondylosis causing spinal canal stenosis, fecal sac compression, caudicoinic compression, bilateral traversing L5 nerve root compression, bilateral, femoral, bilateral uh, neural foraminal stenosis. So this same as what we discussed on the prior, uh, prior question. Once the annulus is completely torn and the nucleus protrudes through it, that's not a, a bulging disc, that's a herniated disc. 
And the way you know you have a herniated disc is from the radiologist word protrusion. Protrusion means it's sticking out. So in our shorty, hi shorty, in our shorty spine, this is the disc. The annulus is this hard outer part. The annulus is ripped. And the soft nucleus that you can't see is putting pressure and irritating a nerve root, just as we saw in the other, uh, in the other picture. What do you do about that? Well, uh, usually epidural injection really helps with a protrusion. If there's nerve root damage causing functional numbness or weakness, then you really need to look at having a microdiscectomy surgery or if the pain is unbearable. But if you don't have one of those three things, if you don't have unbearable pain, you don't have functional numbness, and you don't have functional weakness, then you're a good candidate for epidural injection. Who does that? A pain management doctor. So you're someone who needs to schedule an appointment with a pain management doctor. I'm really psyched next week. I'm going to release my video on how to find a three-star pain management doctor. What are the three things? And spoiler alert, they're board certified anesthesiologist or physiatrist, subspecialty certified in pain management, and are not trying to kill you by prescribing narcotics. As long as they have those three things, they get three stars, and that's the person you want to see. Those are the people. They, they are your doctor. If you have a doctor and you're not sure about them, contact me. Contact me through my best practice page at phoenixspineandjoint.com, resources, best practice. I would love to rate your doctor, and I won't tell them it's you. Uh, some people are kind of funny. You know, they're, uh, they're, they, you know our, we have a, a doctor-patient relationship, and we don't want to offend our doctor. Well, I don't care. I'll, I'll ask them, um, and they're going to tell me. They're, they're not shy either. So we, um, there's nothing, you know, doctors are proud of their credentials. And if they don't have them, they don't have them. You shouldn't be seeing them. It doesn't matter if they don't like you or you're embarrassed. You shouldn't be seeing them. They're not good. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, feel free to contact me through the page if you have a question. Or if you're trying to find somebody who's good, uh, my staff will help you find them. That's what we do. It's free. Come through. Click through. Oh, hey, man. Another question in the chat. I'm so excited to hear from you guys today. Let's see, this is from uh, Sam Casillas. Broad disc bulge, central, more toward the right, C5, C6. Should I be concerned? Um, Sam, I don't know the rest of your situation, but my question for you would be, do you have any, any uh, bladder dysfunction? Are you having trouble controlling your bowels, your bladder? I hope you're not having any sexual dysfunction. Are you having pain down both arms? Or is there pain down one arm? If we're talking about neck pain that shoots into the base of the neck, uh, with this MRI report snippet, no, not concerned. But if you have any long tract signs, numbness are in both hands, uh, pain shooting onto both sides, or if you bend your neck to one side, does that reproduce pain down your arm? Those are the kinds of things you should be thinking about. I don't, you know, concern is, you should always be concerned because you're dealing with your nervous system. But you shouldn't panic. This, these things are manageable. Doctors have protocols for handling them. I think the question for you, Sam, is should you see a doctor? And the answer is if you have no red flags, you're pretty safe to treat at home for three weeks. If treating at home with moist heat, rest, and uh, the, me the, manip the mechanical things like acupuncture, chiropractic manipulation, etc., if those things go well in three weeks, your pain's gone, you're good. But at three weeks, if you're still having pain, it's time to get a doctor involved. I uh, really, I think it's dangerous and harmful to manage these things on your own for too long. It's just dangerous and harmful. What kind of doctor? Doctor could be primary care medical doctor. That's a DO or an MD. Doctor could also be a chiropractor. They're certainly qualified to handle these things. And uh, neck and low back issues are the most uh, common things they do. You want to get a good doctor. How do you know it's a good doctor? They're going to examine you. They're going to order an x-ray. And they're going to make sure there's no tumor or sign of infection or big nasty on that x-ray. And there's probably, there almost never is. So there's probably not. So if you're in that 99.9% .9 or whatever the real number is, it's very, very, very high. You're safe to uh, undergo pain management and kind of go down the, go down the track. It's a really good track. It really works. All right, Sam. Uh, let me know if you let me know if you have any follow up on any of those things. Let's get back to your online questions. 
Um, Prem Kumar, I hope you got it. You got to see a pain management doctor. Uh, uh, click through my site and contact me if you don't have a good one or if you want me to rate yours. I'd love to do it. Kala Alayan. What a beautiful name. Kala. K-H-A-W-L-A. Kala. I hope I'm saying it right. Kala Alayan. Beautiful name. Hi, doctor. Hi, Kala. Thanks for your very informative video. You are welcome. I love making them, so I'm glad it was helpful. That's the whole idea. My question is, does having a second fusion surgery probability, that's a 17% within five years, does that apply for L5-S1 as well? Yes, it does. And what do you think the best surgery or procedure for foraminal stenosis caused by L5-S1 isthmic spondylolisthesis, where I have unilateral leg heaviness and weakness? You, Kala, need surgery, it sounds like. Let's, let's unpack this a little bit. So here's, hi, Shorty. Here's the Shorty spine. And this is the sacrum. This is the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine has five levels, five, four, three, two, one. So Kala's problem is at L5, lumbar five, S1, sacral one. So the disc looks like it's what holds everything together, right? But, and it does contribute to the stability of the spine, but not that much. What actually holds everything together are the joints of the spine. So if I turn you around, so you now you're facing the other way, this is a joint. And this model's a little, little messy, but this is a joint. This is the facet joint at L5, S1. And this facet, this has a part that sticks up. See how it's sticking up? Superior means up. So this is the superior articulating process. And this process has a part where it joins. That's called the isthmus of the superior articulating process. And if you have isthmic spondylolisthesis, by the way, this stuff's even hard for me to say, so I'm, you know, I just forget it. But long story short, just so you know, you have probably because of an accident when you were a teenager, this part, this bone, it has a crack in it. It's not fully connected to this bone. And as a result, your spine can slide. And when the spine slides, those nerve roots get pinched. And if the nerve roots get pinched, it's causing numbness, weakness, and loss of reflexes in your legs. In your case, it's probably numbness between the big toe and the first toe, weakness of bringing your feet up, and the pain shoots down and goes in between your big toe and your first toe. So that's radiculopathy. So look, these the, all this crazy Latin terminology doesn't matter. What matters is what do you do to make it better? It is nice if you can have an epidural shot and cool things down, Four out of five people with spondylolisthesis do not require surgery. Spondylolisthesis means movement of the bones that's resulting in the pinched nerve. Four out of five people do not need surgery, but one out of five does. And the one out of five is the one where you try to calm it down with an epidural injection. That didn't work. So what's left? There's no way to go in there and decompress it. It's already unstable. So you go. a surgeon can go in there, drill out the compression of the L5 nerve roots, put in pedicle screws and a rod to connect them, and that locks the bones in position. And that's a good way to take care of it. So if you're having numbness and weakness in your leg and you failed epidural injection, then you need to see a spine surgeon. You need to see a spine surgeon. That's You can feel free to contact us. We'll be happy to rate your spine surgeon um, if, if they're in the U.S. Uh, anybody in the U.S. will happy to rate their spine surgeon and let you know that you're seeing the right person. If you don't have somebody, call us and we'll help you find a good one. All right. Thank you for the question. It was really, really a good one. Next question from Miss Julie Berry. Hi, Julie. Hi. Awesome info. Thank you. I have a sister named Julie, so it's easy for me to remember. I had ACDF at C4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7. So that's three levels. 4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7. In 8, 2021, 20, I'm still experiencing burning pain in my neck, left arm, and in my hands. Mm. X-rays reflect everything is looking good and there's no issues. Do you know what are your outcomes from going from ACDF to ADR? ADR, she's referring to disc replacement. Thank you in advance. There's really not a good way to go from ACDF to, um, to cervical disc replacement. It's, uh, you, you'd have to take out the fusion that was done and drill it out, and that's just messy. So I don't, I don't think that's a good option for you or, frankly, uh, anybody. Um, your x-ray, your ACDF looks good, but if you're still having pain into the arms, then your nerve roots are not happy. 
So your next step would be a post-operative MRI because the x-ray is not going to show those nerve roots, but the MRI is. So you need a post-operative MRI. If the post-operative MRI shows that there's physical compression of the nerve roots, and sometimes there is, even if the surgeon did the ACDF correctly, you can still have residual compression. It just, it's part of the, nothing's perfect on this earth, so, um, except my grandson. <laughs> so but nothing's perfect, and so you, you know, you got, you got to deal with what you got. So if you still have nerve root compression, then you really only have one way to deal with that, and that's with an additional surgery from the back of the neck. ACDF is from the front of the neck, but the secondary surgery would be from the back, and it's called foraminotomy, where they go in and open up the hole the nerve root comes out of. It's minor surgery. It can usually be done through a small retraction tube in a minimally invasive way. So if you got the right surgeon, and it, remember, who are you going to call to find the right surgeon? Me. Click through on my website, phoenixmindandjoint.com, resources, best practice. Uh, it, you know, the thing says get more content like this, That's, but really, the, uh, I'm going to change that language. But in the meantime, click that, fill out the form, and, we, and my staff will help you. We'll rate your surgeon if you want, or we'll be happy to, um, be happy to uh, uh, find you one that, who's good. All right. Um, so that's you, Julie. Who is next? Nora Zelaya. Hi, Nora. After an incident, accident and an MRI, I was diagnosed with lumbar stenosis with the fifth and the worst. Doctor assumed I was having lots of pain. I'm lucky I can walk. Pain and discomfort after repetitive bending movements. I shouldn't, I don't take any painkillers. And Tylenol only occasionally, but, and mainly for headaches. At 65, I went for my first Medicare visit and I was diagnosed with prediabetes and osteoporosis. Yikes. At that time, I was experiencing right knee and hip pain with limping too. I thought it was osteoarthritis, but x-ray showed no osteoarthritis. I went into a research mode and found there's a moderate ketogenic diet with low carbs, sugar elimination, and severely decreased wholesome foods with plenty of fatty fish, vitamin D, B12. Uh, my, those were low. Physical therapy helped me a lot with my musculoskeletal and prediabetic problems. And for the last year, I've been barely noticing any discomfort at all. I continue my diet and exercise, and so far, so good, and more energy. Ooh, that's nice. This is my experience while trying to avoid any major interventions for as long as possible. I think the level of patient care shown, I like the level of patient care shown in this video. Oh, thank you so much, Nora. That's very sweet. And thank you so much for sharing your story. You know, it's very hard to prove some things which are apparent. And one of those is the anti-inflammatory diet very hard to prove that an anti-inflammatory diet is effective. And the reason is, the way you prove something in an experiment relies on statistics. You have to separate a treatment and a control group. And when you're looking at things like diet and inflammation, it's just all over the place. It waxes and wanes. People don't adhere to the diet. There's all kinds of stuff. But stories like yours are the thing that gives me confidence that an anti-inflammatory diet really does matter. And there's kind of two parts to it. One part is the idea of food as medicine, that food can actually, the right foods can reduce your inflammation. And then the second one is the don't shoot yourself in the foot part, which is don't eat stuff that's super inflammatory, right? Because that is part of the problem. Um, you just can't question that food causes inflammation. First of all, in the extreme form, food inflammation can be so profound that you can have an anaphylactic allergy and die, right? Peanut allergies and other nut allergies, and there's like 15 foods that are 95% of these bad allergies, but there's that's inflammation. It's just a really extreme form of it. So I, you can't deny that what you eat can cause inflammation. I don't think you can deny also that what you um, that you, inflammation contributes to joint pain. So your experience makes a lot of sense. I'm so psyched to hear that the ketogenic diet worked for you and that low sugar made sense, especially given your concern about diabetes. I think one of the hardest things about this area really is getting started because there's just it's overwhelming. So the nice thing about a ketogenic diet is there's you can Google ketogenic diet and follow a recipe plan. 
the bad thing is that is proven not to work. It's very hard for most people to stay compliant over time with those strict regimens. And so I put out what I call TOAST, T-O-A-S-T, and you can see it here on the screen. And uh, check out my video that has these same, um, same, this is the uh, thumbnail for the video. But T is turmeric tea with ginger. Try to drink that every night. O is for the oil I put upon my hair. I don't know why I always think of that Jerry Jeff Walker song. Yeah, I really did grow up in Arizona, but O is for oil. So you wanna have, uh, you wanna get rid of Crisco and all those horrific oils and go to olive oil basically, um, go to olive oil. A is for Ayurvedic cleanse. If you're, man, if you're just, it's seasonal and you're, the wheels just fell off your wagon and you feel like crap and you just need to do something, Ayurvedic cleanse. And the, I recommend the book Clean by Alejandro Junger. There's a one week and a three week version. Uh, both are excellent. S um, and T, T is for track your changes. S is for a statin. If you're measuring your C-reactive protein, and remember, if you don't, would you get on a plane with a blind pilot? Would you let somebody fly with no, no, couldn't see where they were going? Well, why would you get on, why would you do a diet with no idea if it's working? It's not, your weight is not an indication of inflammation. Although, I mean, it kind of is, right? Your weight is a, a downstream secondary indicator of what's going on with the inflammation in your body. However, it's not a reliable one. So you got to follow your C-reactive protein. And I think you should get it quarterly. I think you should get it quarterly if you're doing this stuff. You probably need it anyway because it's predictive of your cardiac risk and all kinds of other healthy things can derive from that. So don't be, don't get on a plane with a blind pilot, people. Um, you know, follow your C-reactive protein. Anyway, just if nothing else, grab my video on turmeric tea and start drinking that tea every night. If you feel better, then throw out, go through your cupboard. Throw out every oil in there that's not olive oil. Just use olive oil. It's super good for you on a variety of levels. Then get your CRP measured. If it's high, talk to your doctor. Maybe you need to be on a statin. Maybe you need help. It, the, everyone deserves help when they, need, when they have health problems that threaten their welfare. Everyone deserves help when they're sick or in pain. And that help is usually in the, not always, but often in the form of a doctor. So don't be shy. We can help. Doctors, they work for you. They're, they're, they're nice too, <laughs> usually, hopefully. Um, well, anyway, Nora, thank you so much for sharing your history. Very cool and gives me a lot of confidence. All right, JC, uh, thank you for the review. You are welcome. That's what we do. Of this most relevant study to me personally, I'm 60. I just blew out my medial meniscus. Ah, Bummer, I'm sorry, bucket handle tear. So just so we are all talking about the same thing, here's a knee, here are the guys facing you. So I turn them around and this is the inside of the knee, this is the outside of the knee, so this is the right knee. Now I turn them around, this is the medial meniscus. This is the meniscus on the inside and you can see what it does. It's where the leg bone meets the thigh bone. The thigh bone rests on it and it allows a normal range of motion in the knee. Bucket handle tear, have you ever seen a, a paint can? How the a paint can has a handle that slides up. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's like a half circle and it comes up. Well, your meniscus can tear like that. The outer part shreds, so it's like a paint can handle, bucket handle tear. It's really a bad form of a tear. If you're under 50, it's a no-brainer to fix these. And what they do to fix them is they fire in little uh, brackets that anchor them to the bone, to the leg bone, and help it heal in that position. If you're over 50, some surgeons are more reluctant to fix them because you don't have as much blood supply to the meniscus. And the experience has been, the experience of many doctors has been that they don't heal as well. You know, um, I can tell you, I'm not a surgeon anymore, but back when I was, the the skill of the surgeon changes what's possible. No, no disrespect, but uh, you know some people are better than others at what they do at their job. So some surgeons are just more skilled than others. Now, if you have an extremely highly skilled surgeon, there's a limit to what they can do, but they can sometimes do things that others cannot. 
I checked with one of my colleagues, Dr. Phil Benyon, who I think is you know, the highest level of a knee surgeon. And I asked him, hey, I've got a 60-year-old guy who has a bucket handle tear. Would you ever repair one of those? He's otherwise healthy. And Dr. Benyon's answer was, yeah. You know, I'd have to look at the MRI and make a decision. But um, let me, I mean, I'm going to get Dr. Benyon on this show to interview him and talk about these issues. I guess my point is for JC, um, yeah, it, it is true that the standard guideline would say that you have to live with this tear. But there are surgeons who fix them. And if you want to talk to a surgeon like that, click through the Phoenix Spine and Joint website, get in touch with my staff. We'll get you in touch with Dr. Benyon's office. If you're in Phoenix or um, if he can see you by teleconference, if something like that could work out, that'd be cool. And uh, hopefully, hopefully get you some relief. All right, next question. You are very knowledgeable. Thank you, I like you already. Fatima Irving. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your YouTube is part of me understanding my annular tear and herniated disc. Ah, sorry you have that. I have four lumbar herniated discs, L3, 4, 5, and S1. I'm 51. I've been in pain for three months. I had four injections today, one on each side of my spine and two in my SI joint. I received transferaminal blocks in the past. I finally got relief in three months. Will I need surgery in the near future? So remember, with this lumbar spine, the low back, Fatima, surgery is done only for two, I'm, I'm sorry, for three things. For severe spinal stenosis causing neurogenic claudication, that's laminectomy surgery, or for um, a herniated disc that didn't get better on its own that's causing unbearable pain, functional numbness or weakness, or just not progressing as, and the pain is just not getting better after 12 weeks. That's surgery. Or the third surgery is spondylolisthesis with stenosis. Now, I don't know your, I haven't seen your studies, but your story doesn't mention any of those. So I don't think you're gonna need surgery, but I don't really know. I don't really, no, no one could know. I, I would need more information. Feel free to click through and come on the show and let, we could go over it and I could tell you what the standard recommendation would be, what the guidelines would recommend. But I can't, I, I can't, I, you know, I, uh, I can't, uh, I'm not a prophet, but I am a doc, I used to be a doctor. And, um, uh, but I do my best for you. Now, what I do want to tell you is just because you're not potentially a surgical candidate doesn't mean there aren't really good things that could be done for you. And those things are epidural injection or radiofrequency ablation or you know, making sure you're not in these surgical categories. And understanding the right treatment for your low back pain is your responsibility, right? Because uh, nobody else is you. You're the quarterback of your own care. You gotta coordinate your pain management doctor, if there's a surgeon, your primary care, if there's a chiropractor. All these people are doing their thing, but you're, the, and they all love you and they all care for you, but you are you. No one else has your back. So you have to really do your research and understand. So you, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're understanding. Now, what are you gonna do? What's the next treatment for your back? It seems incredibly complex, but it's really as simple as A, B, C, or D. You gotta give yourself one of these letters, A, B, C, or D. And it's based on, is your pain mostly in the leg? Feels like lightning or electricity? Is associated with numbness and weakness? And MRI confirms herniated disc, then your pain is coming from a herniated disc. Now, if you watch this show a lot, you know the herniated disc treatment is try epidural injection if, unless you have unbearable pain, functional numbness, or weakness. If you don't have those three things, try epidural injection if 12 weeks, and I think you're already more than 12 weeks. Yeah, you're three months in. So if you have a herniated disc that's causing radicular pain syndrome, you need to look at microdiscectomy. So that would be surgery. Or Fatima Irving, are you B? Ache off to one side of the back. It feels like it's coming from your hip, spreads to your butt and tingles along your outer thigh. That's arthritis of a facet joint. The injections that you had recently sounded like facet medial branch blocks, sounded like medial branch and sacroiliac blocks. So if those blocks relieved it, then temp it's only temporary, then you have facet arthritis and that's gonna be treatable with radiofrequency ablation. 
temporary relief, but 60% of people get, I'm sorry, 80% of people get 60% relief for an average of 10 months. That was super better than nothing, right? Temporary, but still quite good. Or Fatima, are you C? Are you A, B, or C? Pain is in the middle of the back. It's like a knife in the back. It's worse when you're sitting down. That's that annular tear. You mentioned that. So I'm thinking that your MRI shows that. That's that knife in the back here. You know, here, hey, Shorty, here's that disc. The disc is just torn from the annulus coming out. If that's you, then your choices are the, uh, the Denervex procedure where they burn the pain fibers, denervate the disc. It's like RFA essentially for your disc. It's new. Um, I'm not, you know, it's, doctors were always skeptical of new things, but it's got a really good trial data. So it might be the way to go. The ultimate atomic bomb solution is to f take out the whole disc and then fuse it. If you take out the whole disc, you'd be unstable. They have to put a fusion in there. That seems like, you know, killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer, but it could be, could be that sometimes you just got to kill that mosquito, right? <laughs> so I don't know. Um, it depends on your situation, but that's the annular tear. I don't have any evidence for this, but as I finished practice, I was doing some stem cell growth factor injections into discs and having insanely, crazily, unrealistically good results. So I don't know. I mean, I was just, it was so good. It was too good to be true. But it, oftentimes things just look so good, but it, you know, over time you find out it doesn't always, nothing works for everyone, but sure was looking good, something to consider. And then D, pain is mostly in your leg, feels like electricity, it's relieved by bending, that's the stenosis. I don't think you have that because you didn't mention it, but that's where laminectomy surgery is what you gotta look at. It's a lot of information, but it's not that complicated. It's chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, and rocky road, right? It's, we could go into, if, if I told you all the different dyes that made up strawberry ice cream, it would seem like it was super complicated, but it's chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, or rocky road. Like it's, when you're familiar with the things, the fact that there are four different choices doesn't seem like an overwhelming, what if there were 31 flavors, right? It's, you can go to the grocery store and pick a flavor of ice cream. It's, it's just that you're so familiar with them, you're comfortable with it. Now there's only four choices here, but you're not familiar with them. And the stakes are higher, a lot higher, right? You, you want to make sure you get it right and you're not familiar, so it, it makes you nervous. But it's really not any more complicated than chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, or Rocky Road. Put yourself in a, in a category. I wrote a blog that goes into this, how to figure out <coughs> the cause of your back pain. Um, check it out on Phoenix Spine and Joint Resources. Um, go to our, our, um, our blog page and uh, check out uh, this same uh, infographic is there, and it'll kind of walk you through it. Selena Secret Show. Hmm, what's your secret show, Selena? Doctor, Selena, what if you have a herniated disc that is causing severe spinal stenosis and it's in the cervical portion of the back, which is also called the neck? Is there anything that I can do to prevent me from having to go under the knife for surgery? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the degree of spinal cord compression. Remember our shorty here? So this guy, down here we've got nerve roots. This is the lumbar spine. And the nerve roots are very tolerant. So you can have a big two compression. You can have a really big disc herniation down here, fills up a, a large part of that spinal canal and still does not cause damage. It's different in the neck because those are not the nerve roots, it's the spinal cord. So it's much more dangerous. Disc herniation in the neck is much more dangerous. If you're having, you're, you mentioned severe spinal stenosis, that's I assume came from an MRI report. In the cervical spine, that makes me nervous you're getting something called myelopathy. Myelopathy is dysfunction of the spinal cord. Radiculopathy in the low back is the nerve roots, but in the neck that's myelopathy. And myelopathy is dangerous because it can lead to paralysis, it can lead to irreversible neurological loss. Some of the first things that start going on are you start having numbness or tingling or weakness in both arms. It can even feel like it's in your leg. You can get larmites if you cough or sneeze, you can get pain shooting down both arms. If you're having any, and then on exam, your doctor may test your reflexes and they're exaggerated, they're, they're elevated 
hyper too much reflexia reflexes. Myelopathy is spooky. I do not recommend you answer this question on the internet. If you're having myelopathy, you need to be seeing a neurologist or a neurosurgeon who can go over your examination with you, see if what's seen on the MRI is causing a physical manifestation, and then advise you of the risks. So please go get help with this. Everybody deserves help when they're in pain or danger. You're in danger. So go get some help. And let's see what happens. If the doctor recommends surgery, then I would recommend you come on the show. Let's go over it together. Um, and uh, and uh, just maybe I could help clarify why they're recommending that or what's going on. Um, but yeah, uh, that that's the thing. So you need a spine surgeon. Keith Regulus, what's with the Shiva ritual dance they do in front of the collider before they activate it? And then follow-up question, can somebody do research and tell me who Shiva is? Oh my God, you guys, <laughs> these, these questions. So I, uh, I put out that video on the super collider, the CERN super collider in uh, Geneva, where they're um, looking at uh, particle acceleration. And they've had some really, really wonderful medical um, outgrowth of that collider. And the nuttiness of the questions I get on this, this is actually a normal one from Kevin Regulus. He wants to know who's Shiva. Um, Shiva was a Hindu god, the, a goddess. And I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't know probably much more about it than you. And I'm sorry, it's just out too far out of my field for me to do any kind of reliable research. But this CERN is, uh, is it's it's cuckoo for cocoa puffs like there's there's so many people who believe who seem to believe that CERN is a connection to another inter another dimension and that demons and um, black hole end of the world catastrophes you know um, to me this is absolutely uh, another example of a fake argument. There's always been this sense of evolution or creation. There's always been this sense that science is at odds with faith, and it just isn't. Science is a way of answering questions about the world. It's a method. Religion is a belief system based on faith. And, you know, in, in my lifetime, the general population has had a substantial decline in its belief in traditional religion, but I think we're seeing all of this interdimensional stuff, the force, the it's almost as if we've made science fiction our religion and people know, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, stop it. So uh, I don't know who Shiva is really. And I, I just say, if you are, if you believe that some scientists who are trying to understand particle physics and are um, uh, spinning off medical technologies that are really making all of our lives safer and better. If you think that's somehow evil or end of the world stuff, you really need to address what's going on inside of you. Because I'm afraid that you, you have a tremendous amount of fear or anger or something else that really needs to find a more productive release. So the, anyway, that's my soapbox. But that's, that's what I'd recommend for you. Ann Warner, two days ago. Thank you. You're welcome, Ann Warner. Excellent explanation of a herniated disc treatment. My MRI shows I have lumbar foraminal stenosis at L2-3 and two herniated discs at L2-3. What treatment would you advise for that combination? Also, I have a history of ovarian cancer. Um, well, Ann, it sounds like you've had an MRI. Uh, that otherwise, you couldn't know because an x-ray wouldn't show the herniated disc. So you've had an MRI. If your ovarian cancer had metastasized to your spine, we would have seen that on the MRI. So thank goodness that is not what's going on. So ovarian cancer be damned. It's not the cause of this problem. Having cancer can cause other issues that impact treatment. Like if you're being treated for cancer, you may have be susceptible to bleeding. Surgery may not be an option. So it's a good thing to know and inform your doctor about, but it's presumably not the cause. What is the cause? Okay, so here's our shorty. Hi, shorty. So here's five, four, three, two. So we're talking about two, three. Here's the disc. And if I turn her around to the side, this is the foramen, the hole that this nerve root is coming out of. That's your L2, three foramen. 
and your MRI report's telling you you have foraminal stenosis due to a herniated disc. So basically, the first thing you should do, so remember, of our four causes of low back pain, it's not an annular, well, you do have an annular tear, but there's a disc that's herniated through there and is putting pressure on that nerve root. So this is you right here. Facet arthritis is not our issue, and foraminal stenosis due to a bone spur is not apparently our issue. We have foraminal stenosis due to a herniated disc. So we think that's what's going on. The first treatment is to confirm that this herniated disc and this foraminal stenosis is the cause of your pain, and that's generally done by blocking it with a transforaminal epidural steroid injection. You've heard me say it before, but if we can block it, we can tackle it. By blocking it, we, we, com we confirm that this is the source of the pain. <clears throat> Sometimes you don't need to do that. Sometimes the nerve root gives it away because the nerve root goes, innervates certain muscles and is sensory to a certain patch of skin and controls a certain reflex. So the L5 nerve root, for example, we can pretty much nail him down. It's the one that bends the foot up. It's the patch of sensation between the big toe and the next toe. It is a, um, it's pretty easy to identify if somebody has an L5 nerve root problem. But L2, the thing that comes out between L2, 3 is not nearly as easy. And so generally, a transforaminal epidural injection, for all you know, it could help you, but it also has the added benefit of uh, confirming that that's the cause of pain. So if you have a transforaminal epidural steroid injection given by a qualified pain management doctor, three stars, you heard me go through that before, then we're in good shape and we can go on and, um, and uh, look at other things. You should get better on your own within 12 weeks. If you're not, then because the disc herniation is out to the side, you probably are a good candidate for transforaminal discectomy which is best done by an endoscopic surgeon. Now, if you go into a given community, there's probably 25, like here in Phoenix, there's closer to 50 uh, spine surgeons who could help. There's one or two that do an endoscopic approach. So for your L2-3 in this foraminal position, you really wanna make sure you get an a spine surgeon who has an endoscopic uh, arsenal in, uh, in their armamentarium, endoscopic arrow in their quill which is not gonna be very many. So if you want help finding this surgeon, feel free to contact the office. We'll rate your surgeon, any spine surgeon you may be seeing. If you're seeing a spine surgeon, there's probably a 99% chance you're seeing the wrong person, right? Because it's like one in 100. So, and you may even have to go to the next big town over. So, you know, don't, don't go see the like, you know, the, the mistake I see over and over and over that leads to problems or could have had a better outcome and didn't get it is people who stuck with a legacy doctor, legacy surgeon, and didn't really pursue the best surgeon for their problem. I just don't understand this attitude. And I, you know, I, I do understand it, I guess. I think it's based on that doctor-patient relationship. Oh, he's so nice. He was so good to me. He gave me a shot. He was always there. Office was always there when I needed him. But if you're hiring a driver for your race car and you want to win the race, you want to hire the best driver. You want to hire the person who's the best for this job. And quite frankly, from the surgeon's point of view, isn't it really the same thing? I mean, I don't want to, I'm not good at everything. Don't put me in for the, for the knee problem. You know, you want to, the doctor, you, the doctor wants to be the most useful that they can be to their fellow men and women as well. And so the doctor wants to, doesn't want to do cases that aren't the best for them. So anyway, it's a two-way street and I would really recommend get the right doctor, which is not that easy with your particular problem. All right, Ann Warner, contact me if you want to go over this. I'd love to look at your MRI and make a more, more uh, a better, give you a better answer. Sherry Lamb, hello, Sherry Lamb. I've been having RFL, I think you mean RFA procedures, on C456 for the past seven years, yikes. I've got much relief at first, but not so much in the last two years. Can DVR be done on the neck also? And does repeated RFA cause scar tissue on the nerves over time? Yes and yes. Uh, DVR can be done on the neck. It's usually not necessary, but it can be. Um, 
So an endoscopic spine surgeon could potentially do that. Similarly, uh, radiofrequency ablation is, my sense is it's more effective in the neck than in the low back. And if it stops working, oftentimes the things to consider would be percutaneous cervical facet fusion. You just, it's, it's not that hard to fuse the neck from the back of the neck, and it can be done through a neck incision, what's called percutaneous fusion. So I would look for a spine surgeon that offers percutaneous fusion and ask that person or an endoscopic spine surgeon, but that's probably the best way to go. That, that is, in my opinion, the best way to go with that problem. All right, uh, Chris Hart. Hi, Chris, I hurt my knee yesterday. Motorcycle dirt bike crash, I'll oh, bummer. Been there, crashed my bike last week, uh, scraped up everything terribly. How long do I have to wait before I do these tests? My leg is swollen. Can you do it when it's swollen? Thanks. Well, the um, question you're asking is what's the normal, uh, what's the doctor recommended treatment for knee pain? And the doctor recommended treatment for knee pain is take a red flag survey. Are you unable to walk, severe numbness or weakness? Hopefully no. Do you have feverish shakes or night sweats and chills? Probably not, because this is a cr motorcycle crash, not an infection. Have you had a history of cancer? I hope not. You seem young, you're out there on your motorcycle. Maybe I'm stereotyping. Or unexplained weight loss, hopefully not. Um, loss of bowel or bladder control, better not. So you don't have any of those red flags for your knee, then doctor recommended treatment of knee pain is treat at home for three weeks with a, uh, a compression sleeve, ice, rest, anti-inflammatory drugs if you need drugs, and um, uh, see what happens. How long should you wait? Three weeks. If you're, if you're red flag negative and you fail to home treatment for three weeks, that's when you should see a doctor. A lot of people don't realize that chiropractic doctors are actually okay. For, they, know, they know knee as well. Um, it's, it's, they're more commonly for the back, and, but they're trained in the knee and they, they see patients for knee pain all the time. So you might wanna uh, get a, either a medical or a chiropractic doctor, usually a medical doctor, your doctor is going to get an x-ray. It's crucial to know if you have arthritis because if you have arthritis, it changes the situation. By six weeks, if you're not better after some therapy or chiropractic treatment, they're going to get you a steroid injection of the knee. If that doesn't make you better, then by nine weeks, you can look at genicular nerve block, depending on, you're probably too young for this. Um, and then by 12 weeks, if you had severe arthritis, which doesn't sound like you, buddy, you know, severe arthritis is usually people m older than me, my age or older, then you're looking at getting a total knee replacement or a partial knee replacement, but I don't think that's you. So let's skip it. John Stewart. Hello, Mr. Stewart. Thanks for taking time away from your show. Actually, you're probably sick of that joke, this John Stewart, but I'd get PRP done if I was under a local anesthesia. I'm freaking, I freaking hate needles. Yeah, everyone does. I mean, some some a lot more than others. Some people actually, it's not that they even hate needles. They basically have PTSD. I was, uh, when I was an intern, I was doing, uh, putting an IV in the neck of a veteran at the VA hospital in San Francisco. And the guy had a flashback to uh, Vietnam where he thought I was the Viet Cong and we were doing something to his neck and he started fighting and I mean, that's an extreme version of it, but it's a lot of people, you know, you have you might have had a shot when you were a kid that was super painful, and you just you developed an aversion to it that's more than just I don't like needles. We're we're really it's like post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. It's like it's a more severe thing. And lucky for us, you know, three-star pain management doctors, most of them, they're there's the first star you get for being a board certified anesthesiologist or physiatrist. Either way, these are people who are trained to sedate you. So tell them, hey, doc, I know you normally do this without sedation, but I'm terrified. I can't do it. And then they'll have a conversation with you. Well, maybe you just need to pop a couple Valium before the procedure. Or no, maybe we need to monitor you and put in an IV and give you medicine to really sedate you. That's called conscious sedation. Under extreme, I've had patients who were so afraid of, uh, so claustrophobic, we had to put them under general anesthesia just to get an MRI. It's not even painful, it's just fearful. That's legit. It's you, it's, you're in, every, we're entitled to our feelings. 
we're entitled to our phobias. We, you know, what are you going to do? It's real. And uh, thank God we've got drugs to help knock this anxiety down. Anxiety is very hard to treat chronically, but it's very easy to treat acutely. We have drugs that just win every time. And uh, maybe you need one. There's nothing wrong with that. Inject my knees for 10 to 15 minutes, dead in the area. Yep, yep. Um, or else the bone marrow and stem cell thing with the VA. Okay, um, yes, the VA can be very good, uh, but probably doesn't do unlisted treatments like stem cell. All right, look, I'm running out of time. I've only got one more question, and I really want to get... Oh, this is John's another one. Many people have told me just to get the knees replaced, but the thought of having my knees amputated, a metal and plastic piece inserted, an excruciating pain for two to three weeks, unable to be on my own for six to eight weeks, and a whole year before it's done, and the risk of dying from blood clots and metal poisoning, no thanks. John Stewart, that's your mother's knee replacement. That's not what we do today. I have this graphic. Now, this is for hip, but uh, and I'm going to do one for knee, but it's very similar. It's very. These are the actual numbers of what goes on in my center. People come into the pre-op. They're there for 37 minutes. They then have surgery. How long does the surgery take? An average of 106 minutes, so just over an hour and a half. This is not multi, this is an hour and a half surgery. They're in the recovery for 103 minutes and then they go home. The average person is out of the surgery center and back in their own home six hours later. They're not in extreme pain. They usually walk with a walker for two to three days. 80% of patients take no narcotics. They get by just on anti-inflammatories. Most people are a lot better by three weeks. If you look at the pain re patient reported outcome scores from knee surgery, no one is in severe pain by 12 weeks. 32% of the people are in no pain by three weeks. And 85%, 82, 85, I can't remember, are in no pain by 12 weeks. So this is not two years, a year of recovery. The stuff you described was accurate in the past. All right, I'm running out of time. I just wanted to say happy Friday. Thank you for your questions. I missed a few of you. Um, I missed a lot of you. I've got like 10 more questions. Maybe I'll talk to PJ. Maybe we can knock those out on Monday. We don't want to, we don't leave anybody behind. Here at Best Practice, we don't leave anybody behind. Everyone, uh, I, I am not, if I'm not interacting with you directly, I don't know how much pain and suffering is going on. And the thought of leaving somebody without the direction or help they need is not something I can live with. I'll tell you that. So please feel free. If we missed your question, contact us back. We're going to try to knock out the rest of them uh, ASAP. And have a great weekend. Looking forward to talking to you soon. For best practice, I'm Dr. Dan Lieberman. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, there are three ways to ask. Leave a comment on any of our social channels, click the link to our website and complete the submission form, or call or text us at 608-602-4022. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server. Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health. Lastly, be sure to check out new episodes every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we answer all your questions. Yeah.